Okay. Welcome everyone. So nice to see everyone's beautiful faces. This is the Painted Bride's third conversation, intergenerational conversation, um, deep roots, bold future, playing off the legacy of the Painted Bride. So we've been gathering somebody who we have a long-term relationship with. Tonight is Greg Giovanni and a younger artist who we hope to have a long relationship with, who is Eric Jaffe. Um, they did, Eric and friends um, produced The Lizard of Oz, which I'm wearing the t-shirt right now, um, in February at the Painted Bride. And the energy around him and the people that he gathered to put it together, the community was so powerful and so strong. They worked on it for, I think, almost two months at the Painted Bride to create it. But it reminded me very much of the energy that I remember in the early 90s with Greg Giovanni and Big Mess and that community. And um, creating art with that community is just so powerful. So we're gonna get started. Um, this conversation is about an hour long. The artists will, unscripted, uncensored, for 30 minutes they'll ask each other questions. And you can ask questions in the chat section and we'll save time for people's questions to be answered by, by each of them. So I'm going to start it out with um, a broad question. And the question is, what does this moment mean for your artistry? And I'm opening it up. Greg or Eric, whoever wants to start it off, it's, it's great. OK, well, I'll start because um, it's probably pretty short. <laughs> because uh, as you know, like Big Mess no longer really exists. Um, beyond last year's cabaret. Uh, and um, so, you know, for me, it's been a little lonely. I'm, I'm painting a lot and I'm, uh, I've hooked up with a film artist, uh, Andrew Rapaski McElhenney, and he and I have been writing, well, we have a film that we wrote that's coming, that should have come out in December, that's postponed. And, um, but we're still working on other film scripts. So right now, as an artist, I'm a writer and I'm really missing my community. Like I'm missing going out to cabaret as opposed to being in cabaret anymore. Um, I like going. And so I felt like, you know, all sorts of things have, have washed away in my life. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the more I watch people perform on, um, Zoom and and YouTube and whatever they're putting up, um, the more it makes me think that we really have to think of something new. We have to, we're not going to get back to normal. And um, what normal is, is going to be defined by this upcoming generation, which brings us over to Eric. So, sir. Okay. Madam. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eric Jaffe. I use they, them pronouns. I am one half of the creative head of Jaffe St. Queer Theater Company, the production company that put on The Lizard of Oz. And I have been a full-time drag performer for just over two years now. Um, before that, I was a drag performer along with a hundred other terrible jobs. So, uh, you know, these times are definitely scary for people who are relying on that kind of work as their full-time income. But for me, uh, adjusting to this new life was incredibly shocking because I was so immersed at that very time. Like we just put up Lizard of Oz in February, like the end of February. And um, to all of a sudden, you know, have the, the show close and have the community that I'm so used to being around constantly taken away from me was really difficult. And I didn't really understand at first how reliant I was on that sense of community. But I think that over time and over processing what's happened to our world, um, I sort of have been navigating and figuring out how that community can exist in online spaces. And I'm definitely learning a lot of new skills. <laughs> uh, you know, drag performers are always kind of used to doing a lot of things for themselves, but you know, 
video production and editing and sound and stuff like that was never really at the top of my list because my focus was always on live performance. But now that live performance exists in digital spaces, it's a lot of adjustment to try to figure out how all of that works. It's, it's true. Are you, um, have you made any sort of concrete plans and something to do, something you... Yeah, absolutely. So every, I, I definitely work the best when I am on a schedule. Um, so at the beginning of quarantine, I decided that I would do a digital drag brunch every Saturday. Um, and I do it on Facebook Live. And the show starts out with me making brunch for myself. Uh, I play some songs, I tell some stories, I say hi to my cat. <laughs> Um, and it's sort of like if drag brunch were just a drag queen at home having brunch. Um, so I've been doing that every week. And then as far as Jaffe St. Clair is concerned, we put together a cabaret towards the beginning of quarantine, which was called Good Grief, a quarantine cabaret. And we personified the different stages of grief and we added some new ones in that were kind of specific to the situation. But we we did try, you know, we had always planned on doing another big production for Fringe. In fact, we really wanted to do it at The Painted Bride. And, you know, when that sort of, when we realized that that wasn't going to happen, we thought and tried to create a larger scale production in a digital space, but it's so difficult and we have already set a, a pretty high standard for ourselves and we didn't want to move backwards. So we're taking the time to, uh, to start writing things. Uh, like you said, this is a great time for writing. Uh, you know, I would love to come out of quarantine whenever that is with our next production ready to go. So we're trying to spend some time doing that to write and and to, um, to kind of look within on how we as a company, as a theater company, a queer-centered theater company, and one that focuses on uh, deleting all of the gender, racial, and size, and uh, so many limitations that have been put into theater. Um, so we're trying to look within to think about how we can continue to do that and continue to expand upon that. Right, and, and thank God, uh, two things you said, uh, that I want to react to, <clears throat> the, the trying to get a large scale performance on Zoom or you, is nuts. I can't, yes. my, um, <laughs> my long time technical collaborator, I see Stephen Kieber is here and <laughs> he's up to his neck with st this stuff right now because he works for the museum and that's what they do. Um, and it is just, you definitely need, I work with, um, or I'm part of a No troupe, N-O-H, uh, which is ancient Japanese theater. And um, we're doing new plays in English, but using the No form. And that's our big conversation right now. It's like, can we find a way to do this? It's actually really good for this form because No is very static. Like people really like, you come out and you stand and you don't move for about 15 minutes at all. And then you very slowly cross the stage, you know, it's very kind of static, beautiful. I mean, it's a form I love. Um, uh, so, we, but as soon as people try and start singing together, there's a chorus, it all falls out. I mean, you cannot <laughs> you yeah. do it. You need the, the technical ability. Um, the other thing was something about the queer world or being a queer artist, and I can't remember, it was right on the, mm, I, should, I should jot down notes as we speak. <laughs> but uh, that is, I love this conversation, is, is always sad to be on one side of the intergenerational. <laughs> but uh, I, I feel so sad. sad and, you I know, didn't realize. Like, <laughs> that's right. I'm, a, I'm an elder. Um, but uh, queer world right now is so visual. I mean, through mm -hmm. what has happened in society, what has happened on TV um, is far more. I mean, I was a drag queen back in 1980. 
and Ellen's seen it, I'm pretty sure. And um, it, it was not this, it, it, we were still shaving and shaving our chests and, you know, and mm -hmm. anyone who didn't, it was, I mean, it was exciting and fun and everything, but that has suddenly turned into like, drag has not become representing women at all. Drag has become its own beautiful sort of thing and it's queer. Um, and, and very appropriate, I think, for, if it is a new form, this new form of Zoom performance. Yeah, definitely. I mean, drag has really exploded, I'd say, in the last 10 years, especially since the part, since the start of RuPaul's Drag Race, which has given drag performers the chance to really be cele like huge celebrities. Um, and it's given drag a platform that has never been seen before. Um, and like you said, drag has really expanded from the idea of female impersonation to so many different things that cross so many different uh, gender lines. And it really is um, amazing to see. And it does transfer for pretty well into the online setting. Um, for us, our problem was when we try to bring more and more people into a production that's happening online, especially if you're trying to, you know, say, put on a musical, there's, there is so much that, that needs to happen uh, to, to make an online production like that a reality. Um, and I know that there are people who are capable of doing it, um, but it's just it is sort of beyond me at this point to figure out how that works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, th I think we're all, all us artists now are tapping our technical buddies, you know? And, yeah. and I mean, I've always tapped my technical buddies, but now this is a completely different game and it is, is it, it caught us by surprise. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm pretty computer literate, but I have no idea how to make a chorus work mm -hmm. on and if you're doing music you're doing choral music at some point and right so um oh what else oh i um it's interesting what's going to happen with places that are actual physical places like the pain of bride and mm -hmm. you know that has always been a treasured treasured place for me oh yeah i mean we didn't ask permission, but once we were allowed to put a um, full-size backyard swimming pool on the stage. No way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry Gibnes, who was in charge at the point, was came in the ne next morning, like we did it overnight, and he came in the next morning and was rather, uh, he just looked at it and turned and went to his office. It just, you know. <laughs> and it was, I knew that the, um, the weight of it was, uh, I think three tons once all the water was in it and everything. And we covered everything with plastic and, you know, it was just like, and I always, uh, me and Stephen Kiever here, uh, did the lighting, you know, I always didn't, you know, uh, it didn't involve the staff as much. I mean, the lighting staff was amazing too. But um, yeah, we kind of snuck that in there. Um, and cleaned up beautifully. <laughs> and unfortunately, the very next week, a dance trip came down from New York City and they had a kitty sized swimming pool. And they did mega amount of damage to the floor. Uh, because no. a sprung dance at the time. <laughs> and again, your piece it filled me with such joy. It was so transgressive. It was so joyous. And you put so much crap on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Again, isn't it fun working at the bride? What's going to happen now? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, so this was our third production, The Lizard of Oz, and I can't tell you how thankful we were to, to be able to access a space like the bride because there's really nothing else in the city like it, especially when it comes to the fact that we were, 
you know, for, for the six weeks that we were rehearsing, it was our home, you know, we were, build, we were building in there, we were rehearsing in there every night. And it really, um, that's something that we never had before. We were always bouncing around rehearsal spaces because it's impossible in this city, unless you have a lot of money as a company to have a steady rehearsal space. And when you're working with a cast of 15 people with a five person stage crew and a you know, costume team and a set team, you need space for everyone to create. And that's something that we were so thankful to have uh, from the bride was space for all of it because there is a lot of space in there. And it was, it was, it made it, it made the project so much more of a community building experience because you would take a break from your rehearsal and you would go and check in on the people who were building all the way in the back and you would see what's going on with painting and with costumes. And it was, it was so nice for us to be able to gather in such a space. And I really look forward to the time when we can do it. <laughs> and it paid off. Like you and I were talking before and I said, Oh, I love the show. It, um, it looked like big, Big mess if Big Mess had funding. And you were like, oh, honey, there's no funding. We, yeah. funding. <laughs> no, we don't have any funding. Which... When, you, when you don't have money, you need time. And back mm -hmm. in the day, and again, I was performing at the, at, uh, the Bride in the 90s. Um, back in the day, uh, you got the space for a week, one week. So we had to rehearse somewhere and build somewhere else in the justice. So for, for Laurel, I'm guessing to provide this this kind of like workshop welcoming you were there how long you were working on the show for how long yeah, in the we day? were in the space for about six weeks that's fabulous yeah, yeah. That was it was amazing it was incredible like it gave us the chance to really build the show for the space you know you can you can only do so much in a, in a rehearsal hall but when you're in the the space where the show is going to be you can really understand so much more about the piece you know um so i'm wondering for you since i am such a young young child <laughs> if you could tell me a little bit about big mess about how it started what it's um what its goals were and and a little bit about <laughs> um yeah it's uh you know how can i create the time that it was I, I uh, the early 90s it was actually I actually printed out my resume because I can't remember everything <laughs> <laughs> and the first show listed here is 1988 and um, there were no there was very few theater companies and I, I don't think uh, the Arden started until 1990 um, there weren't any other theater companies and certainly no real underground theater and I didn't like, I was trained in theater, I was trained in classics theater, and I don't like theater. Um, so I thought, I'm gonna write a play that I like, and I'll get people to do it. And um, I was very wrapped up in the uh, punk rock scene at the time, and there was a squat uh, in West Philly, uh, where a bunch of kids were squatting this uh, building. And so I kind of got a lot of my actors from the squat, and a lot of my actors from, you know, just hanging out in bars and, oh, you got trained in acting? Oh, you're in acting? You're trying to be an actor? I have a role for you. <laughs> it's just talking yep. people into, into doing this. Um, and we had a lot of, um, a, a good number of really bad actors on stage. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, but that's fine. Um, because the audiences we had, uh, were very loving and very forgiving and very like, they were there to see this crazy thing happen. Um, and uh, I performed in a lot of like warehouses and um, art galleries. You know, we, I had this massive play and we performed it in this tiny art gallery. <laughs> the first Napoleon took place in uh, an art gallery. But we had this series called Napoleon Pull Apart that was, um, you know, it was a farce and just not funny. And this is another really interesting thing. Um, a, a couple of things, let me, let me ramble a little bit. Um, funny in that we cannot, the scripts are no longer any good because they rely so much on stereotype. 
and caricature. Because I'm writing from a kind of a vaudeville sensibility. Um, and, you know, they would appall people now. And, you know, I own it. This is, this is, but it was a very, very different time and we were not as aware. I mean, I have a, I have a character called Prince Abdul Abduski, which <laughs> was funny in 1989, but it's no, you know, just that has vanished and a good thing too. Um, and, but the, magical thing was that uh, that whole series had these um, three drag queens, uh, how the whole thing starts is they're playing cards and they're bored and they start retelling the story of uh, Napoleon and they get it all mixed up with other stories and Jane Eyre and whatever. Um, and then magically the set transforms and we're doing the show. But then the drag queens and drag queens um, lead us through, they, they, it's a great, great for a writer because they got to show up magically whenever I needed them <laughs> and either got assigned to things to do in the show or just showed up to help or whatever so um to me the drag component was always the magical component so that's what's going you know and that's that I'm most proud of you know that survived I am um, I got a, a writing um grant uh for one of the Napoleons and I swear it's because uh, this whole scene, Josephine and the drag queens are trying to organize a union for the prostitutes of um, Paris. And it's a very kind of like union organizing, you know, sex work is work sort of creed. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what that me the, the, the grant. Um, so basically I just, I just wrote, there's some actors, I did some work that was, um, more on the serious side and there's a few actors I've used over and over um, who were very good actors. In fact, Paradox, I don't know if you know this, Laurel Paradox is in Hollywood right now. He keeps getting hired to create um, alien movement. Like we did a lot of movement exercises. I was a real, I was a real theater kid. So we had a lot of movement stuff and um, he was always great at the movement. And uh, now he's gone on to, to be working in Hollywood. Um, so yeah, there is, there is our last show officially, um, other than the cabaret, which is a sort of different thing. Our last show officially was the um, Taking Tiger Mountain lip sync show. And uh, Brian Eno's album, Taking Tiger Mountain, we lip synced, I put a story on it. We lip synced the whole show from beginning to end. And, and that was, because I was, I was fascinated with lip sync. Um, because you can be anything, you know, we have this, story that we're we're putting on top of the the music but the music is the music and you only have that parameter to do it in right. so you know it was it was underground it was experimental it was we never i you know i write a good grant i've gotten a great grant money but i don't write a good like maintenance sort of plan that's the whole difference so you seem to have this company do you have people helping you to keep it a company and, and find out, you know, my friend who used to work at the Bride Billy would, um, would tell me what grants to write. He's like, you have to apply for this. You have to apply for, I was like, once I'm sitting down and apply for, I'm fine. Finding out what, where the money is, is always difficult. So. Yeah, definitely. And that's definitely, um, w was on the top of our list for moving forward with our shows was, now it's time to really get these shows fully funded so that we can actually grow and pay, pay our incredible artists what they deserve to be paid. Um, and, you know, that in itself is also something that's very kind of up in the air right now with how things are because you don't really know um, who has the money anymore because everyone's kind of suffering through these times. Um, but I definitely relate, I relate to a lot of what you said, especially about how you started your troupe from disliking theater. Um, I also went to, I went to school for theater and I was told a lot of things like, um, you know, if you want to work, you have to deepen your voice and walk more masculine and create this version of yourself that is 
marketable to a heteronormative world. And I was like, this is fucking theater. I thought it was the gayest place on earth. And here I was being told to pass as a straight person in order to succeed. Um, and that's sort of why I shifted what I was doing into cabaret and drag, because I was like, well, fuck that. I don't want to, you know, do summer stock where I'm in the chorus of Oklahoma for the next like 30 years. It's just not, that doesn't sound fun. I don't want to tell other people's stories. And it seemed like there were so many queer and especially trans people in this city who have been looked over by so many theater companies because of their differences and because they don't fit into those boxes. And it was so empowering to stand up on that stage with a cast of queer and trans people and put on the level of production that we were able to put on and basically give a middle finger to every company that has rejected all of these artists because everyone in our ensemble had a story about going to these bigger companies and being turned away. And there is, there is something to be said for theater in general, not really accepting the queer community uh, because of their audience, you know? The, right. people, the people who pay big money to go and see shows are primarily old, rich, white people. And they don't necessarily want to see all that. Or maybe they do want to see all that, but the companies aren't really willing to take that risk. And something that really was awesome for us working with The Fringe last year is that we got a lot of that audience into our show. And, and they all were so grateful. They all were so thankful to be seeing something that was not just a regurgitated piece of something they've been watching for the past 50 years. And that's something that we're really excited about continuing to grow. And it seems like something that you were able to do as well. Uh, yes, I mean, it, our, our audience were um, the punk rock party crowd, mainly, <laughs> you know, and, <clears throat> I, and not so much else was going on. So I was able to get a lot of press because you got to get the press, you know, to get more people there. And um, it did create an excitement that I, I think wasn't there before we put it there. Um, but on the flip side, you're absolutely right. There are people now who, I don't want to say drag or um, non-traditional sexual orientation has become accepted because it still hasn't but there are people a lot of people who will pay the big bucks mm -hmm. to be entertained by something that they don't they don't necessarily understand and um so yeah the the audience your audience is different you know you're you're it's um i think a little bit more expansive still small because you know, it's what we do. Um, but in in general temperament and and the, the old white people, um, it's the only old white people that ever saw my show with my parents. Um, the uh, but I think the audience is definitely growing. You know, and I yeah. I see it in my nieces. Um, they're they're very interested in you know seeing theater that is not Tennessee Williams, mm -hmm. seeing something that is you know. A little bit different and, and and the younger generation while plenty of people will try to shelter them from from the real world anytime that i have been able to experience uh kids and teenagers in drag their their response is so incredible and being able you know if if i had seen someone like me at a young age i would have I wouldn't have known what to do with myself. <laughs> um, so I feel like it's just so important to be able to, to reach that generation. And, you know, thankfully with The Bride, again, we were out of bar spaces and there were some queer and trans teenagers who came to our show with their parents. And, you know, it was 
it was incredible. It was so incredible to see the looks on their faces when they saw a cast of queer trans performers succeeding. Uh-huh. And, and I think that that is just so important. And I think that it is, it is so needed right now, especially with how incredibly <laughs> terribly our country is being led and all of the attacks that are constantly coming at queer and trans people. I think that we need to put ourselves on stage and we need to shine because there are so many people trying to take that away from us. Yeah, and well, it's nice to see the shine. And how, how wonderful was the idea of um, Dry Queen Story Hour mm-hmm. at, um, at libraries and everything? I, I, I think that's such a much bigger, much bigger event than we realize, you know, because <coughs> I remember I, I always, uh, well, I used to uh, stage manage the Pride Festivals. Uh, the one in June and the one in um, October. And um, that's my giving back to the community. (laughs) And in October, it's right out on the street. And a lot of people come and bring their kids. A lot of straight people come and bring their kids. So I'm backstage, you know, which is basically a area where all the drag queens are running around and, you know, getting themselves ready to go on stage. And this little girl came by and she just like stopped. And her eyes got really big and she was like, mommy, princesses. And of course, one of the queens was like, oh, honey, we're royalty, but not princesses. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the mother just laughed. Like, this little girl was just like, because the gowns and the hair and the, you know, yeah. just like the glamour. I don't know, children need glamour. Everyone needs glamour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, used to, I used to live next to two little girls. Um, and, you know, I leave my house fully dressed in drag multiple times per week and they would see me and literally shout the exact same thing they would they would you know be like oh it's the princess that lives next door and at the very beginning of meeting them uh they had some questions and those questions were like totally valid for a little kid like why are you so beautiful and you have a beard like you know and why are your your eyelashes so big um but once once we got over the initial hump of like someone uh who typically would not appear to be female presenting can be if they want to be and once they sort of took that information they instantly accepted it because children will take the information that you give it and give them and they will absorb it and once they came to know that as a fact about life they 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 had no more of those preconceived notions and being able to do that for kids with things like story time and you know accessible shows for kids and teenagers and family friendly events that have drag included are so important because they really do send such a strong message to the younger generation. It's true. And I mean, you, you know, how can we make the adults understand that it's not about sex or sexuality or right. any of the dirty stuff? You know, that's because mm-hmm. the kids aren't thinking that. They want to know why your eyelashes are that long. Right. Um, you know. You know, I think that, um, that there's something that my dad told me when I came out to him that has always kind of stuck with me. Um, you know, my dad didn't have the best reaction when I first came out and it wasn't because he didn't love me and it wasn't because he didn't want me to be a queer person, but he, his only knowledge of queer people being from the time that he was from, uh, was that the life that you live is potentially very dangerous. And that was, and that caused him to react a certain way. And once that sort of, once he w- was, was open and was able to experience queer culture and understand that it's not all about being a sexual deviant, um, he really understood. And I think that a lot of older people just don't, 
don't get it and they don't want to take the time to get it. Um, but once you really sit down and talk to someone, talk to a queer person, talk to a trans person, you, you have this sense of humanity that you never had before of we're just people, very beautiful people. That, <laughs> that's how I like, troll people online. I'm like, how many trans people do you actually know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's funny because I might be about as old as your father. Um, one of my best friends who I see has joined us. I'm definitely as old as her parents. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. Um, yeah, my, my generation, like, coming out was really different because there was nothing paved. I mean, coming out in your generation is scary because there's AIDS. You're the post-AIDS generation, which is a whole nother kettle of fish. But in my father uh, worked for General Electric uh, Reentry Systems, which means he sold bombs to the government. And oh. so he was, yeah, so he was um, high clearance. And besides me going to hell, um, which was a big thing in my family, um, his main concern was that I was a security risk. <laughs> Having like being gay was illegal, like completely illegal. It was considered a mental you know, problem and uh, not exactly my generation, a few years before my generation, you could be, could be jailed for it. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it was a totally different terrain. I'm not, you guys, you guys, you know, this, this generation has, certainly has its own problems and everything, but what's really nice is that everything is much more out in the open. There's much more dialogue. It's the same thing with, with Black Lives Matter. Like, we are having dialogues that we should have had years ago. But, you know, and, and people, you know, white folks are going like, oh, there was something like redlining? Really? <laughs> um, you know, there's the argument, you know, this information age and everyone being online, we should be sharing a lot of information and the world will get better if we share all this information as opposed to this world that is getting more contentious because people are fighting more. Yeah. It's, it's a conundrum and, and uh, you know, we, we're living in very interesting times. We're living in a very different world or we're making a, a very different world, I hope. Yeah, definitely. That kind of ties into a question that we actually got. Zoe asked, is there something you're learning or adapting to now that you plan to continue doing after we return to quote unquote normal? So is there something you're learning or adapting to now that you'll keep once we ever reach whatever the next phase is? Yoga. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I've, never, I've never done it before. I've never exercised. I'm a fat old man. And, but now I'm just like doing gentle yoga just because I sit a lot now. You know, I'm used to being very active and I'm unemployed and <laughs> don't, know, don't know when I'll be employed again um so that and and i think just being a lot more quiet and and appreciating appreciating my zoom meetings or appreciating like talking to people even people i love and see and talk to every day the appreciation of of seeing them is grow has grown so yeah yeah there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of introspection. Um, for me, I think that I have, um, obviously now in, in this world, I'm focusing a lot more on producing digital content. And that was never something that was a huge priority for me because I was so focused on my live performance. And if I shared a video of that, that was sort of the extent of my digital performance presence. Um, but, you know, like I said, I am learning and I am figuring out how all this stuff works. Um, I bought a green screen last week and it's just been like sitting in the bag staring at me and I'm like, I know green screen, I'm going to figure you out soon. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think that there is a positive to now having all of this content now online is I can build a better reel for myself and I can, I can reach a larger audience and I will definitely keep some of the 
digital aspect of what I do uh, going after we're in a different state. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's a really good thing. Um, we also had AR ask for Greg specifically, will you speak on directing bad actors or non-actors? Oh, I, I can. I, I've thought about this a lot. <coughs> I'm, I'm a techniques guy. I'm very much like, here's how to pronounce words. Here's how to use your diaphragm. Here's how to, you know, do this. And um, a, a lot... Uh, you got to, as, as the director, you have to change your perspective. You can't be like, this is what I want, do that. You have to come in from, this is what you can do. Let's work with that. Let's build that up. Let's, you know, uh, and memorize your lines. Always memorize your lines. <laughs> and um, the, uh, you try and find, I have this one actor, um, young skunk. Uh, I still call him skunk. He, he went back to his real name at some point. Um, and unfortunately died in a, in a motorcycle accident. But um, skunk, he, he, had a, he had many, many problems. He was a runaway. He, you know, he wasn't a drug addict or a drunk or anything like that, but he had a lot of like anger um, and, and stuff like that, which, I never saw, for some reason, you know, with me, he was always polite and sweet and flirty. Um, yeah, I, he had a lot of problems, but um, I used him a lot and he was a terrible actor. And, um, but he was also very charming. And one time I remember at the Paint of Bride, right in the middle of the scene, we're coming up to a sword fight. He draws his sword and he has some lines and he stops and he's like, Oh, I'm sorry, man. I can't remember what I'm going to say. And the audience loved it. I mean, you gotta let you gotta let your non-actors be your non-actors. You know, you you can't you can't force someone to be a professional. Um, you know, if you if you I had made that decision to use him. That was my decision. It was his decision to say yes. You know, so we have to find the mutual place. But I think what I really excelled in um, at the time with, uh, you know, a lot of the non-actors I was, I was using were, um, were the techniques, were like how to use your voice, how to breathe, how to stand on a stage, how to present yourself, um, you know, just technique. I mean, talent is the X factor. Talent is what, you know, we, we, I can't, no one can teach that um, or, or believability. I mean, you can, if you're an actor and you're working, in, I, I was trained in the method as well. If you're working on method, um, there's a way to approach believability. But you have to be serious minded, and you know, it's like it's a lot of work. We're breathing and standing and presentation is you make it a game, you make it fun. And and I think it made the people I worked with, I hope it made the people I worked with better people or better people in their, you know, in their dealings with society. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, for both of you, and we actually had two audience members who asked um, the similar question was, um, has Hedwig been helpful or helpful or hurtful, do you Ooh, think? How, yeah, perceptions of Hedwig from both of you. Eric, you take that one. Um, I loved Hedwig growing up. Um, I feel like Hedwig is sort of my first uh, look into that like rock and roll, like grungy side of uh, performance. And it was also sort of the first trans story I've ever heard. Um, growing up and, you know, learning the story more, um, there are, you know, possibly some problematic sto issues with the storyline, um, you know, sort of about, someone kind of being forced into transitioning or uh, transitioning not because they feel like a transgendered person, but to, uh, you know, secure their spot with a, a 
person that they were interested in. Um, that storyline doesn't necessarily age well, I would say, um, and is probably not something anyone would write today. Um, but I think that the show has opened up a lot of people's minds, and I definitely appreciate it for what it is and what it did at the time that it was created. Right. For, um, first time I heard about it, um, an actress I used to work with, um, again, a, a friend I used to work with, she's not really an actress, uh, Denise Cavalier, um, sent me an email saying, I just saw the show. It's exactly what Big Mess used to do. Oh my God, you need to see this. <laughs> and, and I hadn't seen it for, um, I guess it was three years later was when I finally went and saw it. And I... I had the same feeling. I, I was like, this is, the music's great. The, the, you know, the performance is killer. And the twist, the twist at the end is, is amazing. Um, and I believe works much better on stage than it does on film. But um, I, did, I did feel that, Eric, exactly what you're talking about. I was like, huh, this is, this is not about a trans person. Right. It's about a person who is trapped into a situation and makes the best of it, which is a very different story than the story of a trans person. So okay. um, it's, it's weird that that's out there. I hope to see something like that and something as successful that is more true to a trans experience. I don't know what that is, but I hope it comes around. <laughs> and AR had the same question about, I don't even want to attempt to pronounce this because I don't know how to pronounce it. AR, do you want to hop on or uh, Eric or Greg? Hmm? I am so interested in like what is, you know, as a historian and a library and an archivist, I'm very interested in what, you know, what is the canon? And, you know, we have, thrown so much crap out of the canon right now, I think, you know, excitingly so. I'm interested in like, what are, what are these new texts? And, you know, I, I'm very aware as a queer individual what shaped me both, you know, in a positive way and then in a negative way as well. And, and you know, like for me, something like Lacage, uh, Fall or, you know, Hedwig, they are these sort of double-edged swords, you know? Um, and it's sort of debating, you know, are are they really part of something that is going to tell us who, how we got here? Or are they sort of these weird side notes? So Eric, what do you consider the canon? Or, or... Um, I think that there's starting to, uh, there, there are things that are starting to pop up that are, that are more, that speak more to the actual trans experience or queer experience. Um, I think, possibly more in like TV and film than in theater right now. Um, but I think Pose is an excellent example of that. I think that it tells the story of like beautiful trans women and the things that they went through and it doesn't overly sexualize them and it doesn't, um, it doesn't do what the media and what TV and film has done to trans people over the past, you know, 50 or 60 years, um, where the only time that you've seen a trans person on television is, uh, you know, they're in the hospital because of, you know, problems with their transition, or they're a sex worker. And um, while those issues do uh, arise in pose, it is not about that. It's about the human experience that these people are um, are going through, and I think that that is probably what I think right now the uh, best e example uh, on film or in television of the trans experience, especially the black trans experience and the ballroom scene uh, throughout the eighties and nineties. Um, there, there are more. There, um, a, a really amazing documentary just came out on Netflix called Disclosure. Um, and it's about all of these different uh, actors who are trans or non-binary and have worked in film and television for so long. Um, and I think that that documentary speaks a lot to 
what the media and what the film and television industry has has done to portray these people, which affects so many people. I think something like 85% of Americans have never met a trans person, which means that their only ideas of what trans people are comes from TV or movies. Um, so when you think about those numbers, it's it's wild to think that their only representation until very recently has not been great. That's interesting. And, and I'm thinking, indeed, theater, live theater, has sort of failed in, in here, you know, in, in creating a canon. Uh, because, you know, we have La Cache Paul, we have um, Hedwig, which are gravely problematic. Um, and didn't they just put revived Tootsie last year? Like Tootsie, that's what I was thinking, yeah. yeah that's Tootsie. another, like, no one needed that in this time, especially if they're not going to update the situation. You know, like, I understand why Tootsie is maybe relevant from the time it was in, but for them to revive it and keep the, the transphobic messages that are deeply rooted in that show uh, was pretty... Uh, <laughs> It was a bold move, I think. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be many, many years before we have conical live theater, you know, live th theater that we can consider part of the canon. Um, because, I'm sorry, as, as fabulous and positive as it was, Lizard of Oz is not going to enter the canon. I mean, you know, and when we speak of a canon, we are speaking of something that is respected and put on a shelf right. and this is part of it. And that has not happened yet. I think it's going to be years before we see that in live theater, unfortunately. Questions are cool. Any more questions? <laughs> oh, Nicole's waving her hand. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to put it in the chat or not, so I hope I'm not out of no, <laughs> out of etiquette. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, this is sort of to circle back to the first question about um, what kind of things or practices or um, activities that you've had to to modify for for this kind of socially distanced, shut down world, um, and what what might be useful continuing forward. Um, and Erica is really interested in you. You were saying that like, um, you weren't necessarily someone who was super invested in like the digital as like a way of communicating with people. And I, I think that's true for me too. I think it was often something that I avoided mm -hmm. um, and uh, in favor of like live experience, uh, which felt so, has this like energy. Um, so I guess um, like we've all dealt with like Zoom meeting fatigue and like how exhausting it is to be in like the digital realm. But I was I was curious um, like what what are you what are each of you excited about um, and as like a digital possibility like leaving like leaving behind the fact that like you haven't learned how to use the green screen yet or <laughs> like leaving aside the like practicals like if you're like imagining like the coolest things that you could have you could think of doing um to kind of translate what you were able to do in like a live messy in-person way online like how, what what do you what do you dream about um in the digital world i'm definitely excited about the opportunities that it presents to like i said like to reach more people um after i started doing digital drag brunch, there were plenty of people who reached out to me and just said, thank you for doing this because, you know, quarantine or not, I can't go to these shows because I, you know, have a disability or I'm not 21 or I can't access the venue and or, you know, drag brunch can often be a very expensive experience. Um, so giving people an opportunity to experience things that they could not access even before um, when that stuff was happening live is something that I think is really important. Um, and I think that 
aside from that, just the idea of having a stronger digital presence presence um, is something that new artists need to have. And spending some, like I said before, like I was, I was so busy working on myself as a live entertainer that I never put the amount of focus into that that I should have. So I'm excited to figure all of that out for myself and see where it can take me. Right. For me, the only thing I can add there is, um, I, well, I'm going to have to point out my collaborator is Andrew R. You were calling him A.R. <laughs> That's, he's, uh, he's my collaborator uh, who I write films with. And, um, well, two things. One is, uh, yes, you can reach a lot more people. It, it goes so much further. And um, we, we write very long scripts without apology. Like if, if it's three and a half hours, it's three and a half hours. That's how long the script is. Um, and the movie that we hope will come out when it's, when the world is ready, um, is I think three and a half hours at this point. Um, but we are starting to look at how to break this down into episodes, like how to sell it to Netflix or whoever, like how, how, how to take a giant story and be true to that story because I don't think people are going to be going to the theater as much as they used to, um, both live and um, movie theaters, which is a shame. Uh, live theater will probably do better because there's nothing like it. It's, you know, it, but I'm perfectly happy. I watched a couple of nights ago, I watched Mary Poppins um, and I was fine. I mean, if they re released that in the theater, I wouldn't have gone, <laughs> but it's like, well, there it is, you know, I'll watch it here. So it's, um, you know, learning, again, learning to adapt to the digital and not just that, but also embracing the digital. Um, I'm lucky in that, well, I'm not lucky that I'm completely unemployed, but I, I don't have to do a lot of Zoom meetings. Like I'm begging friends of mine to do Zoom meetings. They're like, I Zoom all day, I can't. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's nice, uh, Stephen Kiever popped up with his face. He's been doing Zoom meetings all day. It's nice for him to show up. <laughs> I owe you a call. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, this, is the, this is the new way we're communicating and, and we're making our own rooms and inviting our own people to those rooms. And this is, this is kind of the way we're socializing. It's, it's, you know, it's not only learning how to do it, it's embracing it, you know, because what else are you going to do? That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think we're ready to wrap up. <clears throat> I thank you both. I love you both. This has been really a beautiful conversation. And um, it's not about social distancing, it's physical distancing. So let's just keep talking. <laughs> and I thank everybody who was here today. Thank you. Help, help support these artists. Like, we're going to keep having these important conversations. I really think there's value in these intergenerational conversations. And I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I miss you. I know. Good luck. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>